from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the National Book Festival. My name is Marie Arana. I'm a consultant to the Librarian of Congress and a writer at large for the Washington Post. It's an honor and a privilege to be here on this historic mall for the 12th Book Festival, brought to you by the Library of Congress, an institution I think of as one of the wonders of the world. Since 1800, Thomas Jefferson contributed his own collection of books as the seed for the library to serve his fledgling country. The library has been a mecca for book lovers like you ever since. I hope you take the opportunity to look at the marvelous programs and exhibits that our great national library offers the public, both on site and online. I have a couple, two tiny little housekeeping things before I move on to introduce our first speaker. I know you're eager to hear him. Uh, first is that when the question and answer period comes and you step to the microphone, you are virtually giving permission for your face and your words to be archived in the Library of Congress. So um, if you're on the witness protection program, you may not want to do that. <laughs> The other thing that I want to mention is that we have a late addition to the festival. Tomorrow at 2.45, Bob Woodward will be appearing at the festival. But I am here to introduce a writer who has made his mark through an impressive career as a journalist, but he has also found time to give us some wonderful books. His name is known around the globe, and I'm, I'm not kidding, I don't say this lightly. I've seen it on posters in small towns in Peru, and in posh bookstores in Oslo. The book that put him on those posters is a runaway bestseller about one of the most inventive, transforming businessmen America has ever produced, Steve Jobs. I'm speaking, of course, about Walter Isaacson. As president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, a forum committed to the exploration of ideas, Walter has been a tireless mirror on our culture. But he's also a gifted biographer, the author of six nimble, incisive human portraits, among them The Wise Men, about the architects of the Cold War, a biography of Henry Kissinger, another one about Albert Einstein, and a marvelously readable biography of one of my heroes, Benjamin Franklin. The Washington Post has called his books fresh, lively, imaginative, and wonderfully written. From book to book, Walter has striven to explain what it is that makes a great leader, not only of nations, but of science, ideology, and commerce. Walter is one of those people who moves easily from history to politics to mass communication, and there's a reason why. He's been the editor of Time Magazine, the chairman and CEO of CNN, the chairman of the Broadcasting Board of Governors, the chairman of Teach for America. Somewhere along the way, he began to turn his voracious appetite for a good story to making stories of his own. Steve Jobs, his latest book, is a deeply absorbing exploration of the life and personality of the founder and chief of Apple Inc. Given the opportunity to hear the story from Steve Jobs himself, to write an authorized biography, someone else might have turned the book into a hagiography, a puff piece, heavy on accomplishments and light on flaws. But Walter's book is anything but, but that. It is a full-scale, warts and all portrait of a fascinating American. It's the story of a boy who started a vision in his garage with a friend from down the street and turned it into a worldwide phenomenon. As Donald Graham, the president of the Washington Post Company said yesterday, Walter Isaacson's book is yet another perfectly designed product by Steve Jobs, for Jobs knew that for a book about him to be any good, it would have to be written by a veteran telling it exactly the way he saw it, and he chose the right man. I'm delighted to introduce a Washington institution, a newsman par excellence, and an American with a deep, deep appreciation for its history. Ladies and gentlemen, Walter Isaacson. Thank you, Marie, and thank all of y'all for the National Book Festival. It's great to be back. It was about eight years ago that I got a phone call from Steve Jobs. I had known him.
for the past 20 years, since 1984, when he came to Time Magazine to show off that wonderful Macintosh computer. And even back then, in 1984, I saw the passion for perfection and also that impatience that was bred into his personality and how those two things were connected. He showed off the Macintosh at Time Magazine and how beautiful each icon was, made us use a jeweler's loop to look at the beauty of the pixels, the design, that little off-kilter disk drive that made it look like a smile. But then he told us that our magazine um, stank. Actually, he used a four-letter word uh, that I won't use for C-SPAN. Uh, and he said Newsweek was much better uh, because we had not made him man of the year. And I realized then that that connection of that passion for perfection and that driving impatience were all part of a seamless system, the way a great Apple product, from the hardware to the software to the content, is part of a seamless system. Uh, so when he called me about eight years ago, I had just finished, uh, I'd finished uh, publishing um, Benjamin Franklin. I was just finishing up Albert Einstein. And Steve said, I want to take a walk with you. And he said, why don't you do my biography next? Now, my first thought was, OK, Ben Franklin, Albert Einstein, you. <laughs> uh, but the more I thought about it, as Marie said, here's somebody who was the American creation myth, the innovation myth, writ large and writ true, starting a company in his parents' garage with the kid down the street and turning it into the most valuable company in the history of the planet, and doing so by creating great products that transform the personal computer industry, the music industry, the publishing industry, the retail store industry, the digital animated movie industry, phone industry, up and down the line, he was transformative. And so what I realized then, especially since he told me, <laughs> was that he stood at the intersection of beauty and technology. The notion of standing at that intersection of the arts and the sciences. Whenever you see him do a product launch back in the, the period of the iPod, iPad, and iPhone, the launch always ended with a picture on the screen of the arts, the liberal arts street intersection with the sciences street. And I realized that there was a common theme with Einstein and Benjamin Franklin, a theme of creativity, of not necessarily being just smart, because as those of you here probably know, a lot of smart people, and you know that smart people are kind of a dime a dozen. They don't usually amount to much. But it's the innovative, creative, imaginative person who ends up thinking different, as Steve would say, and amounting to something. And that was the common thread of the different people I had written about. And so I got very excited about a, a, a rare opportunity to be really up close to somebody who had transformed our world, to be able to spend day after day, hour after hour with him, and to be able to try to write a story that looked at creativity, innovation, and beauty. So what I would like to do today is a particular, uh, I hope what we in Louisiana call lanyap, a little something extra for you. I'm going to talk about all three people instead of just doing a speech about Steve Jobs. You'll get three for the price of one today. Because I want to, as I was thinking about coming here, distill what I thought were the key innovation lessons from the three most su uh, recent subjects I'd written about. Starting with Steve Jobs, Steve was somebody who really believed that beauty mattered and that success came from making what he called in the 1980s an insanely great product. All of you who've been involved in business or know uh, in creative things know that there's two ways of looking at a business. Steve said you could focus on making a profit or you could focus on making a great product. If you focus on making a profit, Eventually, you're going to cut a few corners. You're not going to make the greatest product you can make. 
But if you really focus on making the greatest possible product, the most beautiful product, eventually the profits will follow. Plus, you'll make a dent in the universe. You'll be a real artist. You'll have made something special. I remember walking around the neighborhood that he grew up, his childhood home, a tract house in Los Altos. And we were looking at a fence that he had built with his father when Steve was about eight years old. And Steve told me that I had to come around and look at the back of the fence to see how pretty it was. And he said, when we were building the fence, my father said to me, we have to make the back of this fence just as beautiful as the front of the fence. And Steve said, why? Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever know. And his father said to him, yes, but you will know. You will care. And the person who has a passion for even the parts unseen is the person who is always going to be a good craftsman and make something right. This, uh, this I saw over and over again in Jobs' career. For example, when they're launching the Macintosh, that beautiful machine he showed me in 1984, with that wonderful sealed case like an appliance, beautifully designed like a piece of art. But before they shipped it, Steve looked at the circuit board. And he said to the engineers on the team, this circuit board stinks. The word stinks is my euphemism for words that Steve sometimes uses uh, a little bit stronger. And they said, what do you mean? And he said, well, it's not beautiful. The chips aren't lined up. Not... And the engineer said, well, Steve, this is a sealed appliance. You've made it so nobody can even open the Mac. It's a perfect appliance. Nobody will ever see the circuit board. Nobody will ever know. And Steve said what his father had said to him, which is, yes, but you will know. So they hold up shipping the Macintosh until that circuit board has all the chips lined up beautifully and equally spaced. And when they got it ready, Steve had them all take a whiteboard and sign their names with Stephen P. Jobs all in lowercase in the middle to engrave next to the circuit board on the inside of that original Macintosh case where nobody would ever see it, nobody would ever know, but he said, real artists sign their work. It was that passion for perfection that made him a, if you've read my book, sometimes a strong cup of tea, somebody hard to deal with, somebody could drive people crazy, drive them to distraction, but also drive them to do things they didn't know that they could do. Drive them to do the things they thought were impossible. Because when you have that passion for product, even though you might drive people crazy, they become loyal to you because they're inspired by your vision of making something of beauty. And I saw that over and over again. They sometimes called it the reality distortion field. Those of you who are old enough like me to remember the old Star Trek episodes, the reality distortion field is just when sheer force of will the aliens could create a galaxy. Steve could create amazing things by sheer force of will. It started even early on when he and Wozniak were working at Atari, or Steve was working on the night shift at Atari. And at one point, they were supposed to create a game called Breakout, which was a single player version of Pong. And Steve says to Woz, you got to design the code in four days, because we have to get back to the Apple commune for the weekend. They were working on an Apple commune in Oregon, or Steve was, hence the name of the company that they would eventually found. And Woz says to him, I can't do this code in four days. It's going to take me a couple of weeks. Steve Jobs had taught himself, even then, to stare without blinking. <laughs> and he stared at Woz and kept saying, don't be afraid, you can do it. And Woz went, don't be afraid, you can do it. Woz said it was amazing. After a while, Woz said, I went back to my little cubicle, I stayed up four nights in a row, and I was able to write the coding for Breakout. That reality distortion field over and over again was able to help Steve push people 
to distraction, push them to anger, but push them to do what they thought impossible. Even with the original Macintosh, the one I mentioned to you, it took a long time to boot up. It took more than 70 seconds to boot up. It was sort of almost as slow as a Microsoft uh, machine. <laughs> so Steve said to Larry Kenyon, the uh, engineer, you got to take 10 seconds off the boot up time. Kenyon says, well, Steve, it's, you know, elegant code. I, I don't think I can do it. Steve said, if you could save a human life, would you do it? Kenyon goes, well, I guess so. So Steve goes to a whiteboard and says, there can be a million Macintoshes sold next year. They'll be booted up maybe a couple times a week. If you shave 10 seconds off in the course of a year, you're going to save the equivalent of 100, 130 lifetimes. Then he looked at Kenyon and said, don't be afraid. You can do it. <laughs> Kenyon said, I went back, went back to work, and within two weeks, I had shaved 28 seconds off the boot up time. Over and over again, this happens. I'll just give you one more example, one that I love, which is with the iPhone. That, you know, walking around Georgetown day before yesterday, watching the lines on Wisconsin Avenue blocking traffic for the next iPhone. Why? Because it's a beautiful, magical piece of technology that you love. Because it's so insanely well-designed and beautiful. And when Steve started off, one of the things he didn't want was something like this. Plastic on the front of the iPhone. He said he wanted a really great, smooth piece of glass that was tough but silky. And the, uh, the claves in China that were making the glass for the stores all didn't meet his standards. He kept saying, no, it's got to be better. Finally, somebody said, why don't you call Corning? Corning Glass in New York. Maybe they can do it. Steve being Steve picks up the phone, calls a switchboard at Corning and says, let me speak to your CEO. Switchboard being a switchboard said, we'll take your name and number and have somebody call. Steve slams down the phone, says, typical East Coast ball. And eventually, the head of Corning hears the story. Smart guy. He calls the switchboard at Cupertino at Apple, says, let me speak to your CEO. They say, put your request in writing and fax it to us. Steve hears about it and says, that guy's cool. And they finally have a meeting. So Steve meets with the head of Corning Glass and says, here's what we need, this type of glass, really smooth. The head of Corning says, well, years ago, we developed a process, an ion transfer process that would make a glass like that, and we called it Gorilla Glass, but we never manufactured it. And Steve went through the process with him. And uh, Steve said, that's what I want. I need it. I need this much by September. We're shipping the phone this October. And so the head of Corning said, well, I just told you, we've actually never made that glass before. Now, this is 30 years to the month, almost, that he did it to Wozniak. I remember sitting. I went up to Corning Glass, sat with Wendell Weeks, a wonderful CEO there. And Wendell just, Weeks just told me the story. He said it was amazing. The guy sat right, right across from me and stared at me without blinking. <laughs> and he said, don't be afraid. You can do it. Eventually, you know, after the meeting, Weeks picked up the phone and called a plant manager of a Corning plant near Lexington, Kentucky, a plant manager he liked and said, I want you to start right away shifting from making flat screen gla TV glass to Gorilla Glass. Of course, the plant manager said, well, we don't have that. And basically, Wendell Weeks said to him, he said, I just said, don't be afraid. You can do it. <laughs> the upshot is that's why every piece of glass on every iPhone that year and every piece of glass on every iPhone in your pocket and iPad is made by Corning Glass because Steve had a reality distortion field and got people to do things like that. He also had a passion for beauty, and for him, simplicity was the ultimate sophistication, which was a phrase they used on the first Apple marketing brochure. That, as Einstein would say, simplicity is the key to understanding the way the good Lord created the universe. He, he believed in simplicity as beauty, just as Newton did, just as Kepler did, just as all great people who try to understand the universe. They understand that simplicity 
is a way of saying we have not just eliminated stuff, we have gotten to the essence and we understand it. And we can really feel whether it's what a screw does in a particular computer or the way Maxwell's equations deal with the speed of light. There's a true simplicity that is integral, at least in Steve's mind, to beauty. For example, when he's creating the iPod, that absolutely wonderful machine, and what he had done over and over again was not invent totally new things. I can remember having an MP3 music player before the iPod, but they were brain dead. They were junky. They were horrible. You couldn't figure out how do I put songs in, how do I make a playlist, how do I get to the, so you know, the interface, how do I get to the song I want. Steve said, make it simple. He said, just this simple. A thousand songs in your pocket, three clicks to get to any song. And they said, okay, okay. He said, no manual, no instructions, three clicks. So they would show them the different interfaces they were coming up with. And it would have the, uh, you know, different ways. He said, well, I can't get to it in three clicks. And he'd say, not good enough. And they'd say, well, we need a screen for the title, and we need a screen for the artist and for the al He said, no, no, you don't need all that. Three clicks, any song. And finally, they come up with this absolutely beautiful, intuitive design. You all remember it, the original iPod, which is that scroll wheel. You get to any song you wanted. As you scrolled longer, it went down faster. It was all simple and intuitive. And he loves it. But he looks at it, and there's a big old button on top. And he says, what the is this? I'll leave out the middle word. They're a little bit scared to answer, but at one point, somebody finally says, Steve, that's the on-off button. Steve nods and says, what the does it do? <laughs> now they're a little scared, because they know he knows what it does. They finally say, Steve, it turns it on and off. And then he says, why the do we need it? And it slowly dawns on him, you don't need that big old button. If you quit using your iPod, it powers down. If you start using it again, it knows to power itself back up. You know, you don't need a big old button to junk it up, to go on off. So they take it off, and it was that the sort of understanding of the beauty and the essence of simplicity. I think that uh, when it came to Einstein, he too had that beautiful vision of simplicity that he always asked himself, what is the simplest way to make things as simple as possible, but no simpler, in order to understand the universe? And he was driven, too, by the second characteristic I wanted to talk about, which is just pure, driven curiosity. Einstein, when he was six years old, while Steve was building a fence, Einstein's dad gave him a compass. Compass, just one of those usual, you know, toy little compasses with the needle points north, and Einstein goes around, he goes there, he keeps turning it, and nothing is touching the needle. There is nothing physically hitting it, yet that needle keeps swinging and pointing north. Day after day, he said, he walked around and looked at it, trying to figure it out. Now, you and I remember getting a compass when we were kids, probably, and we'd go outside, whoa, look, it points north, and about a minute, minute and a half later, we're on to something. Oh, look, a dead squirrel. And we're on to something else. <laughs> For his entire life, Einstein was curious, driven by a passionate curiosity for what is a force field? How does an electromagnetic field and gravity, how does it push physical objects? What's the difference between a force field and a particle, an object, whatever? He's doing that his whole life. In fact, at age 17, he starts studying Maxwell's equations that describe an electromagnetic field. And if you look at Maxwell's equations, or if you're Einstein and you look at Maxwell's equations, they say that an electromagnetic wave always travels at the same speed, the speed of light relative to you. No matter how fast you're traveling towards the source, away from the source, that light wave will always travel at 186,000 miles per second or so, the constant speed of light. And Einstein said, at age 17, he does a thought experiment. 
a light beam rider. He said, what if I was riding alongside a light beam and I went really, really fast and I caught up with the light wave, wouldn't it appear to be stationary relative to me? And he said, but Maxwell's equations don't allow for that. He said he walked around in the woods for days on end, his palms sweating, because this thing so unnerved him, he couldn't figure out how this could be. Now, I remember what was causing my palms to sweat at age 17, and it wasn't <laughs> Maxwell's equations, but that's why he's Einstein and we're not. And even after he graduates from high school, he's a runaway, he goes to Switzerland, he goes to the second best college in Zurich, the Polytechnic, and he can't get a job. He can't get a job, he can't get his doctoral dissertation accepted. He's not sort of the preeminent physicist of Europe in 1905. In fact, the only job he can get is as a third-class examiner, a patent clerk in the Swiss patent office. But he's looking at devices to synchronize clocks. Uh, why? Well, you know, Switzerland had just gone on standard time zones, and if any of you know Swiss people, they tend to be rather Swiss. They really wanted to strike seven in Bern at the exact same moment as strike seven in Zurich. And so the only way to synchronize the clocks is to send a signal between two distant clocks, and that signal, whether it's a light signal, radio, electric, whatever type of signal, travels at the speed of light, and you got this patent clerk still saying, but what if I caught up with it? Still curious. And finally, just by a thought experiment sitting on the stool in the patent office, he says, you know, if somebody's traveling really, really fast in one direction towards one of the clocks, what's synchronized will look different to him than somebody traveling in the other direction really fast because the signals will take that fraction of a fraction of a nanosecond to catch up. And so if what's synchronous is different depending on your state of motion, time is different depending on your state of motion. And he makes the correct leap that the speed of light is always constant, but time is relative depending on your state of motion. Now, don't be afraid if you don't get it right away. It takes the physics community about 10 years to figure out that this 1905 paper is so cool. But that was that curiosity that drove Einstein. Franklin had it as well. Benjamin Franklin, they're all runaways at 17. They're all dropouts in some ways. Every time I speak at a college, the college president says, you don't have to emphasize the fact that all three of them drop out of college, do you? I say, well, no. Franklin's a runaway. Actually, he drops out of high school. Done before, he doesn't get to go to college. And he goes over to England uh, after running away to Philadelphia at age 17 because he wants to be a printer and he wants to buy the printing fonts and type and presses. But he hears from the ship captains how it takes a little bit shorter, a day less, to get across the Atlantic to Europe than it does coming back, something not fully explained by prevailing winds or the turn of the earth. So on the way over, Benjamin Franklin's curious. He's heard about these things that ship captains saw. So he drops a barrel into the ocean at different depths every few hours, measures the temperature of the water, and is able for the first time to chart the Gulf Stream, to understand what the Gulf Stream is. That's really cool and curious at age 17. But the thing about Franklin is, more than almost any other regular, ordinary citizen, he traveled through his life back and forth across the Atlantic more than anyone, many times. And even at age 80, when he's coming back from England after he's done the Treaty of Paris and ended the American Revolution, he's still dropping barrels of water, still taking the temperature, still trying to chart that Gulf Stream. But it wasn't just the curiosity that, to me, was Franklin's salient trait. For me, his salient trait was tolerance. We are standing on a national mall that is a testament to common ground for we the people. The notion that we can find common ground and all come together. But at both ends of this mall, there are buildings in which the notion of understanding tolerance and common ground are in conflict these days, just as they were in 1776. Benjamin Franklin realized that that ability to tolerate he had run away from Puritan Boston to a Philadelphia that was filled with Anglicans, Moravians, Quakers, Jews, slaves, freed slaves, all sorts of people. And that being a shopkeeper on Market Street, 
He had to be open and tolerant and be part of a society that drew its strength from its diversity. And you see that when he forms his little club of tradesmen and artisans in Philadelphia in which they look at the traits you need to be a good citizen. He lists all those traits, industry, honesty, frugality, and he shows it around to the other people on Market Street in his club, showing how well he's mastered each of these virtues. And finally, one of his fellow shopkeepers in his uh, leather apron club said, Franklin, you're actually missing a virtue you might want to practice. Franklin says, what's that? And the friend says, humility. You might want to try that one for a change. <laughs> what I love about Franklin is he said, he admitted, I was never very good at the virtue of humility. I could never master it. But I could master the pretense of humility. I could fake it very well. <laughs> now, here's the genius. And he said, and I learned that the pretense of humility is just as useful as the reality of humility. It makes you listen to the person next to you. It makes you try to find that common ground where we all share certain values. So through his life, with his humility and pretense of humility, he's the founder who brings us together to find the common ground. When they're writing the Declaration of Independence, the Continental Congress creates a committee. Maybe the last time Congress created a great committee, but it has, you know, Franklin, Jefferson, John Adams on it. Jefferson gets to write the first draft. The wonderful Library of Congress, which sponsors this event, has the first draft out in, in the Library of Congress. And you see Jefferson's draft saying, we hold these truths to be sacred in that wonderful second paragraph. You see Franklin's printer's pen crossing out the word with those backslashes. We hold these truths to be self-evident, he writes. Because our rights, he said, come not from the dictates or dogma of one religion or another, but from the consent of the governed and rationality and reason. The sentence goes on in Jefferson's draft to say, and they're endowed with certain inalienable rights. You see John Adams' handwriting, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That balance of the role of divine providence and our own rationality and reason and consent of the government in forming our government, that type of balance created this new type of nation we created back then, one based on tolerance, the humility, or at least the pretense of humility, to listen to others and to try to find the common ground. It even happens at the Constitutional Convention after Franklin has come back for the last time, still measuring the Gulf Stream. And they're fighting in Philadelphia over the uh, big state, little state issue. The Connecticut Compromise has gone down in flames. And finally, Franklin gets up and he does a speech about humility. He said, the older I get, something really strange happens to me. I realize I'm wrong at times, that I'm fallible. He said, and you're going to get old and it's going to happen to you. You're going to realize that at times you were wrong. And so maybe we should each listen to the person next to us and try to find the common ground. And they come up with the compromise that he actually makes the motion for, which is a Senate based on each state and a House based on proportional representation. And he has them line up and sign it. And he says, um, he, you know, he says, we have to each doubt our own infallibility because this is the document that brings us together. And when they open the doors, a woman comes up uh, to Independence, what's now called Independence Hall, and says, Dr. Franklin, what have you wrought? What have been given to us in there? And he says, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Because it was up to each one of us to understand that tolerance that is the heart of our society. So those were the three virtues that I learned from the people I wrote about. They also had one other particular virtue, which is this ability to think different, as Steve would say. That imagination to think out of the box. Einstein, sitting there on the desk of the, uh, at his desk in the uh, patent office, everybody else has read Newton's Principia that begins with a premise that time marches along second by second, no matter how we observe it. Every other physicist and scientist has taken that as gospel, but Einstein, the patent clerk, says, 
How do we know? How can we be sure? Let's think about this differently. Now, every now and then when I did my talk on Einstein like that, people would come up afterwards and say, hey, you know, I'm like Einstein. I think different. I think out of the box. I do have to remind people it's useful to be like Einstein and know what's in the box before you start thinking out of the box. But it was because he could think different that made him so cool and such a great physicist. Likewise with Benjamin Franklin. Takes so many things he did, but for example, in the 1740s and 50s, people still thought that lightning were thunderbolts from God, God to strike down things. They would consecrate and bless the bells on church steeples in order to ward off lightning, and then they would store the gunpowder in the churches. But the lightning kept hitting the steeples of the churches, and people were killed, and things would blow up. And um, finally, Franklin said, maybe we should think about this differently. And he flies that kite in the rain, which we all think is some silly little experiment, but it is a significant scientific experiment of the time to understand that lightning is a flow of electricity and can be drawn down by a lightning rod. And obviously, Steve Jobs, when he comes back to Apple, after being ousted in the wilderness for 12 years, the first thing he does is an ad campaign saying, think different. And he read it to me, or not read it, from memory. He told me about those ads that he wrote. And it was, here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the round pegs in the square hole. It goes on and finally says, and those who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. By the end, he was crying after he recited this. He said, to me, that's always been the mantra, the ability to think different. But in thinking different and in following your passion, they also did one more thing, all three of them. Every now and then, in fact, probably every time you hear a baby boomer give a college commencement speech, you hear the advice of following your passion. They all three followed their passion. But the important advice is this whole world isn't just about your damn passion. It's about being part of something larger. It's not just about you and your passion. It's about being part of something larger than yourself. And that's what these three people understood. Uh, Steve Jobs, around this time last year, when he was feeling very ill, I asked him about that. I asked him about you know, what he thought the legacy would be. What is, he said, yeah, I talk about following passion. But what I really now realize is that there's a flow of history, a river of history. And we all take things out of that flow of history and get to use them ways of making food or building houses or wonderful products that people before us have created. And part of our role in life is to put things back into that flow of history that are truly beautiful and truly reflect what we believe. And I asked him, did he believe that after he died, you know, his spirit would live on? He had been trained as a Zen Buddhist. So do you still believe in God? He said, I like to believe that you know, when I die, my experiential wisdom and all I've learned will indeed endure somehow, still be there uh, in some fashion, in some soul, in some spirit, some incarnation. He said, but I guess sometimes I worry a little bit that maybe when you die, it's just like, you know, an on-off switch. You die and click, you're gone. I was taken aback, of course, and just stared for a moment, and then he gave me that wonderful half smile he has, and he said, maybe that's why I didn't like to put on off switches on Apple devices. <laughs> but I miss him. Um, and as for Einstein, you know, one of those equations in 1905 in the last paper that year basically translated to E equals MC squared. And that set a lot of things in motion, including eventually the atom bomb. When Einstein is dying, his aorta has erupted. He's decided not to have an operation. He's in Princeton at the hospital, knowing he has a day or so left. What he does is he signs the Bertrand Russell Albert Einstein Manifesto to say, we have to control these atomic weapons in our age. But also, even as he's dying, he's still that 17-year-old, that 6-year-old. Curious, how does that force field work? And he had brought, he had asked his assistant to bring nine pages of equations that he was still working on in his office. And he sat there on his deathbed, still writing 
line after line of equation, making math mistakes and crossing them out, trying to figure out a unified field theory, a field theory that would help explain electromagnetism, gravity, the force fields, the particles. I went to Hebrew University just to look at them, where they're stored, and you finally see that last line where it dribbles off and falls a bit as he's dying, as he's writing one last line of equations that he thought would get him and the rest of us one step closer to that spirit manifest in the laws of the universe. And as for Dr. Franklin, that tolerance carries with him as a larger thing in being part of something larger. During his lifetime, he donated to the building fund of each and every church built in Philadelphia. At one point, they were building a new hall. It's still there, still called the new hall, right to the left of Independence Hall. And he wrote the fundraising document that said, even if the Mufti of Constantinople were to send somebody here to teach us Islam and preach to us about Muhammad, we should offer a pulpit, we should listen, for we might learn something. And on his deathbed, he's the largest single individual contributor to the Mikveh Israel Synagogue, the first synagogue built in Philadelphia. So when he dies, instead of his minister accompanying his casket to the grave, all 35 ministers, preachers, and priests of Philadelphia linked arms with the rabbi of the Jews to march with him in the grave, to the grave. That's what they were fighting for back then when our country was founded. And that's still the struggle we're in, in this world today. So I hope you've enjoyed my distillation of the three lessons of my three great heroes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Time for a couple of questions, if I may. Virginia. The person with the Virginia T-shirt, and then the Washington Nationals. Virginia for Obama. All right, and Washington Nationals. Uh, one of the characteristics I thought you might speak of, at least in one of the really phenomenal portions of your book about Steve Jobs, was the characteristic of focus, and how he called focus. Apple when he returned to Apple to focus on right. what was important. If I, uh, if I had to do the seven or eight lessons, simplicity is related to focus. And what Steve always did was, I've got to filter out distractions. Um, for example, uh, when he, as you said, to take the example of returning to Apple, they were making like 40, 50 versions of the Mac to try to milk the profits of it. And he said, why are we doing all these computers? Finally, he said, we've got to focus. And he just draws a grid that says home, office, laptop, desktop. He says, that's it, just four computers. We have to focus. Likewise, when they finally get those four computers down right, they take uh, the top 100 people at Apple and they're arguing what should be our next product. They're all on a whiteboard. They all fight to be on the first page of his whiteboard. They get 10 of them after two and a half days from the 100 suggested. He crosses out the bottom seven, says we can only do three. We have to focus. And that's why you have the iPod, iPhone, iPad, that focus. Yes, sir. I wondered if you had any particular commentary on that theatrical work, the agony and ecstasy of Steve Jobs, and also any dramatic attempts on any of these people you did biographies I, You on. know, I'm a print person. I, I, I lived in the right century. I love books. I love the narrative form. So I'm not an expert to talk about theater or movies. Uh, I love them. I go to them. But that's just not my uh, expertise. Sorry. Yes, sir. Thanks for being here, and uh, great book. Loved it a lot. And um, I was wondering, I know you did a lot of interviews with Steve, and you did a lot of audio recordings of those interviews, yeah. and we got to hear some of those uh, on uh, network TV um, a while back. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's any plans to release those in the future. No, at, at the moment it's complicated, but because there are you know, things in it that are personal, and uh, I really respect Steve. And there were things I had to leave out of the book. Uh, you always have to b balance when you do a book what's useful to the reader, but also what's going to be too hurtful to somebody, or compromise Apple. I, I didn't put in all of his thoughts about Apple TV. I figured the people at Apple have the right to try to make TV on their own now. Uh, I've been, I'll cooperate with people who are doing research on things, but for the moment, that's complicated. Last question, I think. I've been given it, and I have a wonderful woman there who deserves the last question. Yeah. 
Last question here. Okay, did Steve Jobs uh, continue to be involved with the suppliers of the materials for his products uh, up until the end? Uh, there's so much publicity, for instance, about Foxcom and China. And was No, one of Steve's that? things was focus. And this book, you'll say, well, gee, why doesn't he worry more about Foxconn? Well, Tim Cook did. Tim Cook is somebody went over and visited and things. Steve always said to me, I can't do everything. I really have to, as the gentleman asked at the beginning of the question, focus on what I must do best and what my true passion is. And sometimes people say, well, he didn't focus on Chinese workers. He didn't focus on, you know, whatever it may be. But I do think by creating the iPad, he will have done more to transform education in this country than a whole lot of the people who try to, like myself, focus on ed reform. That by creating great products that showed the intensity of his ability to connect beauty with science, which is what's going to make our nation great in the 21st century. And if you say, well, he should have also focused on these other things, I will remind you, we are in the biography tent. This is not the how-to tent. These are not management books that say, here's how to live your life. Ben Franklin led his life much differently than Einstein, much differently from Steve Jobs. Ben Franklin was a great philanthropist who really brought people together and cared about, you know, all the supplies in America and how they work. But he never invented the iPod, iPhone, or iPad. Everybody does something different. And the reason I tried to weave three people together is to say, don't try to just emulate one person, but realize these are flesh and blood people. Franklin made mistakes, even on tolerance. He allowed the advertising of slavery in the Pennsylvania Gazette. And at one point, it owned a couple of household slaves, which he realized was abhorrent, so he freed them. But he becomes the president of the Society for the Abolition of Slavery to make up for what he called that errata, or era. So none of these people is perfect. They all are flesh and blood. That's why in the biography of each one of them, people say, why did you put you know, their less than savory sides? Well, because they're like us. Don't try to just copy any one of them. Realize that biography is understanding our world, our values, and how you might apply them in your life. Thank you all very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.